right now. Please. Here's the link in the chat. Did you tweet it? I'm doing that right now. Are we on? We're live. Going oh, hi, live. live. With... We're live. Oh, I'm so excited. With Planet Mitch. DFN Podcast 67. Faster and than you. it's out. Awesome. <laughs> I'm so fast. <laughs> yeah, well, I need to start copying and pasting like you because you got a better gig than I do. It's All right. Keyboard shortcuts, buddy. Keyboard shortcuts. All right, I'm stretching now. You ready to start the show, Mitch? Uh, yes, sir. In Primed five, and ready. four, three, Sorry. two... Hello and welcome back to another over-exuberant episode of DSLR Film New Podcast. Mitch from Planet D joins me today to discuss all kinds of stuff. We've got some interesting new field recorders. We've got a lens that's really sexy. But first, Mitch, before we get started, I want to ask you a question. What is your favorite piece of kit? See, you're throwing me for a loop, DJ. Good morning. Thank you for the awesome intro graphic. For those of you listening on audio, you missed it. Um, here I am all prepared to tell you about my dinner engagement tonight with Craig from Canon Rumors because that's what I'm doing today, and you throw me for a loop with a gear question. Way to go, DJ. Way all to right, uh, let's just, we'll, we'll just draw that one off the list. No, no, no. I'll, no, no, no. I will fail again. No, no, no. Anyway, Craig from Canon Rumors is in St. Louis, so I'm going to have dinner with him, which is awesome. Uh, my favorite piece of gear, you ask? Well, kit. Kit and gear, that's the same thing. <laughs> I don't know. Yes. I'm currently shooting everything I know with the 5D Mark III and the 70-200 IS-2 from Canon. I just fell in love with that lens, and I can't let it go. It's on my body all the time. And I don't mean my physical body. I mean my 5D Mark III. <laughs> um, I've shot training stuff with it. I've shot people, stills, video Everything I shoot right now is with that lens. It's crazy. And so I've got a lens pick here, and this is actually something I've been shooting with lately. This is a really old school Canon FD 55mm f1.2 lens. Uh, it's not the sharpest lens in the world, not the perfect lens. It's got a little bit of discolorization when you shoot with it, but it creates sort of beautiful vignetting and sort of an original image that you don't normally expect. And this lens, you can find it on eBay for about two hundred dollars. That's a fifty-five one-two for about two hundred dollars. This is the oldest of the F one two series in the FD line from Canon, so you can notice that it doesn't have the fully uh, integrated uh, focus ring. Yeah, so it's just a little weird. This one's stranger <laughs> than the other ones. The other ones look a lot cleaner. Uh, they started to get their design up and running. This is like the 70s model, but super affordable. You can adapt it to anything, and it's really cool to have in your kit for that price. I will be talking more about super... Uh, yeah, never mind. I'm just going to set this down now. I had something more to go on, but it's just not coming to me today. So, on that uh -oh. note, Mitch... I'm... You mean it's all up to me today? <laughs> oh, man. I should have poured myself a cup of coffee this morning because I'm just not going as fast as normal. Well, it's only, what, 2 a.m. for you? It's, yeah, I, I was up at 4.30. It's 5.40 my time, so 5.40 a.m., awesome. The dedication uh, DJ has to this show for you guys and gals is amazing. On that note, Mitch, I think it's time for, for the news. The news. Time for the news. It's time for the news. Time for the news. First up, let's talk about some lenses here, and this is actually the lens I was going to dive into, but then realized that it's actually part of the news story list. <laughs> this is the SLR Magic 50mm f1.1. Now, SLR Magic has been making lenses for Micro Four Thirds cameras for quite some time. This is a venture into the full-frame realm for the Sony A7 line of cameras. This is a pretty sexy lens, and it's priced to sell. We're talking a price tag of $349. Now, the reason I actually brought up that uh, Canon FD lens is because that's about $150 cheaper than this SLR Magic. Now, if you've used any of their super wide 
uh, or because I believe they have a, a 12, a 50, or large aperture opening lenses like the uh, 0 0.95. They usually have a lot of vignetting in the corners. They're a little bit soft, wide open, and I'm guessing they're going to have the same issue with this one. But Mitch, what do you think? A 50 millimeter f1 or f1.1? Yes, that's correct. 1.1 is just such a weird number. Do you do you think that's a, a good value for 349? <laughs> Well, let's see. We have to, A, see what it looks like when you shoot with it, right? That's the first qualifier. No, you just buy it um, based on the f-stop. Specs, yes, the sexy 1.1 f-stop. That's all you need to know. Just go buy it. Use DJ's B&H link, please, because we need some affiliate income. <laughs> How am I doing? How am I doing? You're nailing it, man. You're nailing it. I'm nailing it. I like that it's a full-frame uh covers full frame sensors that's I you know because that's all I shoot I'm a full frame kind of guy and that's not my width of my body or anything I'm talking about cameras now I'm Where's wondering my sound effects <laughs> sorry it's kind of weird on this <laughs> lens um, the lens comes with built-in uh, focus gears so you have your regular 0.8 pitch gears all the way along the focus ring, a decollect aperture ring, and they still give it an f-stop instead of a t-stop. So this is f1.1, but uh, in a t-stop format, you're probably talking more like f1.3 or f1.4. So okay, time out, time out, time out. For those of you who may not know, and it took me a long time to know, and I don't know that I've ever heard that there's a real difference between f-stops and t-stops in terms of actual values but do us all a favor and in 10 seconds or less explain the difference between f-stops and t-stops f-stop is a calculation based on the size and length of the lens and the aperture opening t-stop is the actual amount of light that makes it into your sensor in your camera so when you hear somebody say t-stop and the t-stop number is slightly bigger than the f-stop number that is the reason why if you look at the Rokodon lenses for an example their film lenses are f1.4 but their t-stop lenses are t1.5 that's because wow. even though it calculates out to 1.4 you actually get the equivalent of 1.5 into the sensor so the good news about t-stops that I learned from Shane Hurl, but I'm sure you know that name. Sounds familiar. <laughs> Was the fact that, you know, with T-stops, you can use different lenses from different manufacturers or different lenses from the same manufacturer, doesn't matter. But you're a lot more confident in what kind of light is coming in through than just using F-stops. Yeah, the T-stops are very precise, so if you're switching between multiple lenses and you go to the same T-stop, your light into the camera is going to look pretty much identical across Thank the board, whereas you, you have variants. Thank you but for taking time to say that. <laughs> there are some noobs out there, right? Isn't yeah. this a dollar film noob? There is actually, and uh, Devin caught me the other day, we were talking about gold batteries, and uh, somebody wrote us in a question asking what a gold battery is, and I'll save that for Devin's episode, but, uh, <laughs> you know, you, you get used to using equipment like that, and then oh, you yeah. forget that, uh, you know, if you just call it by the brand name, people may not know what the heck you're talking about, so. Buzzwords. On so, this lens, though, uh, there are some comparable lenses here. Let's take a look at these real quick. Uh, this is 349 for the SLR Magic, but also Miticon had a Sony 50mm f0.95 lens, and this is a, a very monstrous lens. Uh, there's been some iffy reports on build quality of this guy, but it looks like... You know, everybody seems to be jumping on the A7 bandwagon. Now companies that uh, formerly made Micro Four Thirds equipment are starting to make full-frame sensor lenses. Uh, Mitch, do you think this is a, a continue barrel roll of Sony taking over the entire market? <laughs> you know, I've, I've put off saying it for a while, but uh, Canon's really struggling right now. I mean, everybody shouldn't, – I shouldn't say everybody. Obviously – I'm having the same problem you are, but I don't drink coffee. That's all another story. Uh, Canon lost like 23% last quarter. I mean, yeah. their profits were down. Um, Sony is doing pretty well. Obviously, both companies are spread across a whole line. We're not just talking about cameras and lenses. They're, you know, copiers and 
all these other wacky stuff that the, both guys do. Uh, but it's great to see that many people are moving to Sony in that Sony's moving fast and doing stuff that we really like, especially I'm still really excited about the five axis stabilization on the, on the body as opposed to having to buy it on each individual lens. And you know, Canon makes so much money off of those lenses. I'm not sure they'll ever do in body stabilization, even if the market demands it. I, I just don't know. Yeah, those uh, those f two point eight primes that they released here recently with built in IS are just I don't know. It's it's sort of a gimmick to me because at at the price you're paying seven ninety nine, you might as well go buy the L glass and, and put your camera on some sort of stabilization platform instead. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so Sony's taking over. They're they're gonna own the market probably uh, next year. Canon. Sorry, Cannon. Goodbye, buddy. We're Goodbye. we're changing the name to Planet A7. <laughs> that got you. <laughs> right in the middle of a drink, too. Sorry. Oh, man. <clears throat> uh, so, regardless, these are some interesting lenses. 349 for the SLR Magic. Take a look. There's pre-orders out now. It looks like it'll be shipping in uh, December. Next up on the list is actually another yet-to-be-released item, and this is the Tascam DR701D, not to be confused with the DR70D. I uh, love that Tascam is iteratively making these numbers more and more complicated. Now, <laughs> this is sort of an interesting animal here, Mitch, because basically we have the same four-track recorder that we had in the DR70D, and we were actually having a little bit of confusion about this because in their literature they say it's a six-track recorder. Uh, going through all the specs, you still have four inputs on this guy. Uh, this guy features uh, basically the same XLR inputs, the same line inputs, but now it has a mixed track. And what they're doing with this, and this is interesting, is they're taking a extra set of stereo recordings out of the entire mix and mixing it down. So it's basically just a final mix of all four tracks that are coming into the unit. Now what's really weird about this, and uh, I'll get your comments in just a sec, Mitch, I'm going to run on for a little bit on this one. Uh, the input as an HDMI input which allows you to sync and control start stop recording via your camera so if you have like a 5d attached to this you can actually send time code to it it'll sync up and start the audio recording and stop the audio recording accordingly now what's really interesting besides the BNC input is that this guy also has audio out via HDMI and I'm wondering how many channels you get because the HDMI standard supports up to Eight H or eight PCM uh, audio channels on a single HDMI cable. So, could we get all four channels into a recording device like a Ninja, or are we going to just get the stereo mix down? Now, Mitch, that's a lot for me to dump out on the table. Let's get your input on this. What do you think about the DR seven zero one D? Oh, you want me to talk now? Oh. Just so offended that you wouldn't let me butt in there. No, I've and there there is a lot that you said there, but you didn't even mention that they've added dual built-in omnidirectional microphones to this baby. Well, the DR70D has the it same does. microphones as the DR701D. Okay. So it, I've got it. In fact, um, here, let me do this. You guys want to see? Okay. This is actually what we record the show on, and you'll see right here there is the built-in microphones for the DR70D. Now, you also okay. notice, this is kind of interesting, I have uh, words written across here. It's because the menu is complicated in this guy, and when I need to figure out how to get back to a particular recording setting, I've written notes on the device so that I can find it in the freaking menu. Well, okay, so I stand corrected, and I am standing because I have a stand-up desk now. But um, I didn't realize that the 70D had the mics built in. So, so what the heck are they doing talking about six tracks? I'm confused royally now. Okay, so basically the, the extra two tracks that they're giving you are a mix-down track. So... Oh, okay. You, you set all the volume levels and inputs for channel 1 through 4. You apply whatever compressor, mic input, effects, uh, roll-offs, and so on. 
and then it generates an extra stereo track of that entire mix inside of the recorder, which is your technical fifth and sixth track. Okay. It's, uh, it's a little goofy, like uh, not 100%. I mean, I, I do know why they're doing it, because if you get into post and you have four tracks, you have to mix things down, and you, you need to use an, uh, an audio editor of some kind to, to do that, or you need to load the tracks into your timeline. But that's still a little hokey. I mean, most audio people I know aren't going to want the, the single stereo mix out of the unit. They're going to want all the individual channels, and they're going to want to have that fine-tuning control because your audio effects in your NLE are going to be much better than what you get in a Tascam dr zero one d blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Would that be – would you be able to send that out for some reason, like to your 5D via the line out? Yes, Would you that can. Make sense so for the, for the mix down. So yeah. the the DR seventy D and the DR seven hundred one D have the same mixing path out to camera. So you can send that out to camera. The difference is the DR seventy D did not have the extra two tracks also recorded in the unit. It just mixed it out and gave you a final mix out to the camera. So uh -huh. you say, uh, sort of had the exact same thing going on. In the DR70D, it's just that it didn't record those. It sent it directly to your camera's microphone input. So that's another weird one. Like, I don't know. If you're going to sync sound, then you're going to want a scratch track on your camera in order to sync that sound. Right. Maybe you would run it directly from the recorder, and if your audio is good enough, you'd just keep that. Uh, this is just a strange unit to me. And <laughs> the other thing that I want to know, and I, I couldn't find anything in the manual on this, is the HDMI out. Because... If you look at like something like the uh, the Ninja Two, uh, the uh, that guy will record up to four channels of audio via an HDMI stream. So, if this will shoot out four channels of audio via HDMI, then you could theoretically capture the video stream via the HDMI output because it's a pass through for video, and get four channels of synced audio that you would all have wrapped up into a nice a single container file that you can put into your editor and start working on. Uh, that's a pretty slick option, uh, although convoluted and lots of freaking cables. I don't know. Right. Right. Maybe now that I'm thinking about all the cables, the HDMI is not the strongest sticking device in the world. Maybe this isn't <clears throat> such a good idea. <laughs> and, well, and and I mean at that point you're basically only using this if you were doing all of that convolution. You would only be using this as a preamp, right? I mean that's all it would really be. Yeah, basically a, a method for bringing in uh, four channels of audio and then a backup audio recording source. Right. Uh, now, it does have uh, time code capabilities, right. so if you have multiple units like scattered around a set and you're able to run BNC connectors out to each one of them, you could make sure that all of those Tascam DR70Ds are synced up together and you'll be able to drop them into your timeline. And there are some issues with extremely long recordings on the Tascam DR70D of audio drift uh, because the clock is not quite as solid what? and stable as it should be yeah you, you get a, a really long audio recording maybe an hour and a half or so and you have video to go along with it and when you lay that down into the timeline uh, around the 50 minute mark or so you'll start to see your audio slip by a frame and so then you have to you know cut a little bit out and squeeze it over oh, just man. a touch uh, that was a problem that was actually really prevalent in the original uh, Zoom H4. Uh, they fixed that in the H4N and models to continue from there, but it's basically, there's a crystal oscillator in there and they're using a really cheap one that doesn't quite kick out a, a good signal. So, um, Mitch, you're looking around like you're bored as heck. Maybe I'm <laughs> diving too no, far. No, I'm... I'm no, it's it just sounds like uh, another rant. You remember last week we had a rant about the uh, black sun problem that was appearing, and you know th these are all things that are known factors, right? Why is it that these vendors continue to pass problems down from model to model without 
fixing them. And okay, so they don't want to spend an extra 50 cents on a better crystal? Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of asinine. Um, looking at this, though, it is a, a way to iterate. Hey, look, we bring you a newer, improved model. Uh, right. The DR701D will set you back about $600, while the DR70D is in the $240 price range. So a significant what? cost increase uh, for some minor improvements as well as the sinking capabilities. I'm not really hot on this guy. Uh, at that price range, you're getting into the price of more pro-level uh, field right. recorders. You might want to, unless you really need four tracks of audio, look at some of the Roland offerings or uh, Fostex has some very nice, uh, I think the F F E R D 2 is a really nice unit. So, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Why can't these people put out decent names? I know, man. It's just like, and now when you have the DR70D and the DR701D, like it's very, and they look almost identical except for the HDMI and BNC connector. So uh, from a distance, you wouldn't know for sure which one is which. And, you know, accidentally ordering the $600 one versus the uh, yeah. $238 one, vice Good versa. For Good for them, right? Uh, Good for B&H. King. So it's a field recorder. It's a thing. Uh, check it out. There's links in the show notes. Uh, this is going to be shipping in January, so keep an eye out for that. Five ninety nine. That's a steep price. Moving on down the line to another <laughs> steep price is the failed drone. This is the Van Vaughn from the Torque Group. Uh, I don't know what either of those words really mean to anybody in particular, but this little guy was originally designed to be a $250 ultra-portable tiny little drone to fly around your living room to shoot both photography and video, uh, mostly for selfies and so on. But they've collected $3.4 million and Ooh. delivered a few of these that were uh, less than working condition, and now it sounds as though the company may fold. Mitch, another example of Kickstarter's gone awry. How does this make you feel about backing a product like this? Uh, damn. It, it's interesting and scary, and I don't typically want to... I mean, it's so exciting that the Kickstarter, you know, you go in and get maybe $100, $150, $200 off of a particular large priced item and it's it's kind of really a draw but to have a company bring in that much money and not be able to deliver is really a, a check you know um and i find it interesting that they apparently on the kickstarter project have an official statement that was released yesterday but only and backers can see it. I can't read it because you have to be a backer in order to see it. It's like, oh, you scumbags. That <laughs> sucks. I mean, what, what did they really say? I guess somebody's probably posted it on a news site somewhere. But man. Yeah, there's some quotes to it. Uh, there's a BBC article on the... Uh, the original release, and then they follow kind of the the creators through the process, and you can read that, uh, find out a little bit more about the project. This makes me kind of scared for something that I threw my money in for and still have yet to see. Uh, remember this guy, Mitch? Oh, yeah. The Lily. Yeah. It's yeah. a girl. Come I pulled on. the trigger on this uh, as soon as they announced it, and this isn't even protected by the limited amount of protection you receive from something like Kickstarter, because this is just giving pre-order money straight to a company. I put my my hat in on this guy maybe, what, six months ago? Yeah. Five months ago, something like that, and still have yet to find out anything about release dates. Uh, these guys do send me emails and messages about uh, uh, hiring new people for their company, but... Uh, you know, hiring does not a product make, so when, where, and how will we get some of these things? Now, this is not me disparaging the lily. Uh, it, it could very well come to fruition. It's just that now you start to question everything when you see these projects yeah. kind of get started. You get really excited at the beginning. You're just 
ready to roll. You want to buy that thing? You're like, take my money. I want this. And then, you know, six months later, you start to realize that maybe it isn't going to be yeah. what you promised. Yeah. And, and that happens probably more than we want to acknowledge. Um, did you, with the Lily, did you pay full price down? Uh, no, I paid whatever the introductory discount price was. Oh, well, okay. You remember we were talking about the Light L16, the iPhone-looking 16 sensor camera? Yeah. They only wanted a deposit of 100 bucks, or was it was 200 bucks. So in order to get in on the special deal, because so they didn't go through Kickstarter, and they didn't charge me the full price for that. So I've only put $200 into it so far. So even if they don't deliver, I'm not out the whole $1,200 that they want for that product. Yeah, and I'm so trying to I find like out. way of doing it. For sure. Let's see, pre order, what did I spend on the Lily? Uh five ninety nine, I think, is what yeah, it right. it appears. So that sounds sounds about right for the I have about six hundred dollars of imaginary money just out there in the ether uh that I may never see again. Well, you know, I've said I think I said on this show a couple of weeks ago that I don't do Kickstarters because of some of those issues. And it turns out I've forgotten about one that I did do. I've probably done several. I, I've done several films. I know I've done several films, um, but I ended up buying a, a battery pack that uh, you know is big and beefy enough to potentially charge a DSLR battery out in the field. Mm. Um, and I for I think it was like a hundred bucks or something. Then you can charge your iPhone and all that kind of stuff, but. It's been like two years, and they, they sent me an email last week saying, we're just about to ship your order. And I'm like, God, that was – I've forgotten about it. That's how long ago it was. And so – and it and they kept having to stretch things out because the manufacturer, they would fly to China, and the China wasn't producing the quality they wanted. And, you know, so I'd get periodic email updates. So it does go back to the fact that it, I've worked for – Boeing for years, and I know how difficult it is to manufacture new stuff because we'd go out to the shop floor all the time and talk to them about products that we're trying to get out. So lead times and working with vendors, especially overseas, is a real bitch. And so you you get really excited about these new products, and then you have to caveat that with you may not see that money or you may not see that product for a year or two years or more. I've had uh, probably 40% very positive and 60% very negative on the Kickstarter program. I ordered this vacuum jar uh, for my coffee. Uh, and that's kind of a weird deal, but it's uh, it's like a glass tube with like a vacuum handle. <laughs> and it works really well. I love it. Um, and they, they had it to me within a month of the Kickstarter finishing. They also, there was a contest where they machined a coffee scoop handle out of a solid block of metal, and I won that. So I have this Whoa. like five hundred dollar uh, coffee scoop that's you know a one of a kind. It's kind of interesting, and that that was fun. But then you have things like uh, the pressy, which was a button for your phone that was supposed to be able to activate whatever you set, and the button showed up, but it doesn't work worth a darn and uh, you know the the software that the the kickstarter program offered is awful doesn't work on anything is useless uh, is a piece of junk but i mean thankfully that was only eight dollars and then i have other stuff that i'm kind of still on the fence about like my e1 camera right here that i've been shooting off and on with i mean it's really good hardware and uh it's coming together but right now this is still sort of a beta unit i'm using because each time they release a firmware update for it, you get a few more things working. And when you see the Kickstarter, you're like, oh, man, this is going to be great. I got, you know, it'll do this, it'll do that, it'll have all these things. And when you get it, it's like, well, it has a few of those things, and eventually it'll have a few more. And, you know, when they get time to, you know, write some more code for it, it'll do these other things. So I don't know, man. I'm kind of soured on the whole Kickstarter program in general. <laughs> It's 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 a lesson learned, isn't it? Yeah. 
Now, moving on to uh, something that will bring in money for you guys. Uh, the gig economy is getting bigger and bigger. And when I say gig economy, I'm talking about things like Uber and uh, these uh, task rabbits and so on, the things that can send you out to do a single job and make you a little bit of cash. Now, Mitch put this in the rundown, and this is Uber. VidMob. Am I saying that correctly, Mitch? Yeah, I'll give you two points for that one because that one's correct, yes. Two <laughs> points for DJ. VidMob. Is- Basically, from what I understand, Mitch allows you to uh, what become a editor for hire to edit people's, uh, you know, homemade home shot videos. Is that correct? In a in a quick sense, yes. It allow it's it's like crowdsourcing, sort of for for editors, um, or if you want to liken it to Fiverr, you know, Fiverr, right? Not everybody knows about Fiverr. Yes. No. Uh, no, Fiverr's not ringing a bell, man. Fiverr's not it. No, you don't know anything about Fiverr. Let so Fiverr, F I V E R R dot com. There's two R's. Fiverr is a place where you can go and theoretically pay somebody five dollars to do a small task, typically small cast task. Now you, they then escalate depending upon larger jobs, but you can find. Graphics, ebooks, people that will you know, transcribe stuff. If you need voiceovers, like if you want a better voiceover for your news segment, you know, some sexy girl talking. So you can get all kinds of people that are doing work for five, ten bucks on Fiverr. Now, that's great for them, you know. So, so there's two sides of that. One is the commercial person, the person or the 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 buyer who needs the service, and the other side is the seller, somebody who can supply the service. And VidMob is specifically targeting people who are going to shoot video. And, it, and, and they typically are showing in the demos people who are like you and me that go to Cancun for our vacation and we shoot a bunch of video. And then it sits on your hard drive and because and, you don't ever make the time to go edit that stuff and put it into a cute little video. Okay, so... That's one aspect of it would be personal videos. The other aspect of it that they talk a lot about in, in the link in the show notes is to my good friend Michael Artsis, who is over at Be Terrific TV. And they interviewed on the day that the launch happened, the CEO of VidMob, and it's an hour and 20 minute long interview. So you get a lot of details about what's going on. <clears throat> Excuse me. But the second side of it is companies need videos, right? The little small segments, <clears throat> excuse me, um, excerpts, you know, social media stuff, maybe even commercials. And so if you use FidMob either on the iPhone app, and there is not an Android app yet, or you use their desktop version, you can basically upload all the videos to their server and then it goes out to a bidding system you say well here's the title that i want i want it to be about two minutes long and i want it to be a happy-go-lucky style so you can have some different inputs to the editor and then it goes out to a bid process so what happens is the editors on their side all start seeing these new projects popping in and they can start bidding and say, well, I'll do that job for 50 bucks. And then you can see their, their bio. They have, a, you know, like a, an edit reel or some kind of a reel. So you can go see what kind of stuff they've done before. And then you can hire them. You pick mm-hmm. an individual to do the editing. So it's, it's awesome for editors who may be looking for some extra work. Now, you may end up getting stuck with, you know, editing some really crappy personal video. I would be really worried about what kind of footage would come in from something like this. Uh, well, but you, you know, get, as an editor, I'm sorry to interrupt. You get to see what the video is because they've already uploaded it, so you uh, can see what the material is as as an editor. You get the opportunity to know what you're bidding on, so now, it's not just like, oh, I want a you know personal Cancun vacation. I watched their their demos here, and we've got like uh, this family and the daughter going to college, and it's you know it looked really good, but <laughs> yeah, you know, h- how often is, are you going to have like the perspective of a cameraman running around you as your family you know 
lets you pack up your car and go off to college. It's right. It's not right. realistic unless well, you have a, like an extra kid that you don't want or care about to run around with the camera. It, but that is also one of the aspects of it. Let's say, for example, you do a family vacation and mom and dad have their cell phone and the three kids have their cell phones and maybe grandma and grandpa go on the vacation as well. You can upload all and get invite everybody to upload video for that project. So if you, ha it's not just your stuff. And there, mm -hmm. there comes the mob quote unquote aspect of it. So it gives you the ability to do more. I mean, especially stuff like if you have old video sitting around, if you know, I've got gobs of video of the kids sitting around. Wouldn't it be nice to pay somebody 100, 200 bucks to put something together as opposed to me spending 20 hours doing it because I would get so wrapped up in going, ooh, and ah, you know, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> but, but the other aspect of it, I mean, Fiverr is, you can, I can, I've, I've used Fiverr quite a few times and paid tops like 40 bucks and gotten, you know, icons for a website or something. So you can get graphics and all kinds of stuff at a pretty decent price. Uh, I think most of this stuff is it's it's not it's not like you're going to pay ma, some guy five bucks to do four or five hours of editing to n nail your movie down to five minutes or something. It's not as cheap as it would be. To, you know, I, there's a Fiverr mentality is what I'm trying to say. Many people who know Fiverr um, are, have gotten to the, maybe you call it the iTunes pricing because everybody's gotten used to paying a dollar for a song, right? As opposed to an album that you used to pay 15 bucks for. Um, so pricing is, has come down for a lot of things. Now, if you can get a professional video, and especially on the business side of it, if somebody could go shoot some video of a conference or something and have, you know, people shots and behind the scenes and B cam kind of stuff, and you pay hundred, two hundred dollars to somebody to edit that as opposed to hiring somebody on your staff or having some crummy person who thinks they know how to edit, you know, you, have a, <laughs> I, you a know, big it, problem. In, in business, you typically have the office assistant that you hand the stuff to and say, hey, go edit this or do something. And she's like, huh? I don't have any experience in that. So you, you have the opportunity here to hire some quality editors. And editors have the opportunity to do some spare time work. I mean, the video that we posted this morning on Planet 5D, there's a, they have it an editor's kind of side of it, you know, they're excited because they can do a one, two hour job on a lunch gig and fill in some spare cash. So the good thing about it is that, you know, the buyer pays the money up front. So the cash is held by VidMob until the job is done. So the editor knows the money is there. It's not like they're doing this on spec and are just praying that they're going to get, you know, once they're awarded the job, they, they don't want to spend four or five hours, 10 hours, whatever it takes. So the money's there. It's not like they're going to get screwed on the end. Now, there is still the aspect that the buyer can say, no, I don't like your edit. So there are some back and forth things that could happen there. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a nice opportunity. It's brand new, just came out yesterday. It was just put on the iTunes store, the app store. Uh, Lots to be explored there. Could be really good for people who need some work as an editor. Opportunity that wasn't there before. Now, you've got me thinking about it. And the, the one that I normally use, and I'm not familiar with Fiverr, but I used 99designs on an occasion right. for graphics work. And, you know, I have friends that are actually graphic design artists. And uh, a, a TJ Rowe is one of them. He works for... Uh, several design companies that do uh, DVD covers and so on. And he gets really upset when I talk about using 99design because he's a full-time graphic design artist. And the 99design, you, you basically say like, hey, I need a logo that looks sort of like this. And you put it out, people bid on it, and then you pick the whatever bid you want and you, you go for it. And they're doing the work for way less then he would get paid to do it, you know, on a regular day. So 
it's tough for these sorts of things because it's sort of the more people that are doing it and the the easier it is to make access if you're paying five dollars for something you're devaluing the entire market in a way that's going to eventually pull out money from extract it from one small group and and spread it out across like a, a very large group and i can i could i'm concerned with uh, something like this because if you have editors that are working for next to nothing then uh, you're going to slowly eat away at the editors that work for a lot, but always generate, you know, awesome quality. So what's that going to do to the market in general? The, this is an age old argument or discussion that has gone on for decades and decades. It happens time and time again. And you mentioned several things. Look at Uber. You know, Uber has upset the market or Airbnb. And, and by the way, <laughs> There's some real risks in terms of doing Airbnb because there's no liability insurance. And if you get injured somewhere, I was reading an article about that the other day. Some guy died and there's no liability. But anyway, so yes. iStock Photo, for example, has been the same argument that professional photographers are going to be dead, right? iStock Photo has been around since 2002 or three. And so what you have to realize is that this opens opportunities. It doesn't necessarily devalue the professional. And I stock photo is a perfect example, I think, or a, especially since it's in the creative field. I, as a buyer, let's say I'm a brand new website and I'm just starting out and I cannot afford to hire a professional photographer to shoot some great photos for my website. It just it, might, it would cost me six hundred to a thousand dollars, right, to go hire a photographer to do a really awesome job. iStock Photo came in and said, "Well, you know, the photographers need to sell some photos, and we'll sell and 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 people like Mitch need a website, and he needs some awesome people pictures or you know photos of X Y Z." And he's willing to pay ten, twenty, thirty bucks for that, as opposed to a thousand bucks. And so what you end up doing is opening new markets. I mean, there are thousands and thousands of people who buy stock photos from places like iStock, but the professional photographers are still in business. They're still charging what they need to charge. I went down to a studio in St. Louis. These guys have this massive studio a couple of weeks ago, and they're having clients hire them because they're doing specialized food photography kind of stuff. Yeah. And they're making a boatload of money. I mean, they're just... They've got 20 people in the studio, and they've got clients coming out. They're doing all sorts of amazing stuff. So is the photography market, professional photography market, dead because of iStock? No. We're, we're 20, almost 15 years into that. So what it does is it opens up a, a new market. Now, it also provides a source of income for people that never had it before. I mean, I was doing iStock photo. I would never sell hire myself out as a professional photographer, but you know, I stock photo and Shutterstock, I should say start Shutterstock because they've been a sponsor of Planet 5D in the past, so maybe I should be using them. Oh, sorry. And <laughs> you know how that goes. <laughs> but I, when, I, when I first started sh shooting stock photos for iStock, I had a crappy little Canon XTI, right? And I made two, three thousand bucks, and I went out and bought a Canon 5D, a full-frame camera at the time. And you know what? That was the genesis for me starting Planet 5D. And now look, I have a full-time business running my website because I was able, partially because, I mean, not exclusively, but I was able to make money selling photos that I wouldn't have ever been able to do before. So it opened up an opportunity for me and it's become fabulous. Now, there are thousands of people around the planet. I even talked to my daughter last night, my 17-year-old, about she loves to edit stuff. Sometimes she edits my stuff. I said, well, you know, you could apply to this and you could end up being paid to edit other people's home videos. She might like that. She never would have considered that as a full-time job, but she might do it for fun and make some extra cash. Now, what is the end, end goal with this? Can you still, you know, make time in your life to be a full-time editor, find a real job, and then do this on the side? Is this just for side income, or is this 
you know, would you consider doing this as a full time like position, basically, just hoping that you get enough edits to come in to keep your money flowing? I, I can imagine both people. Now, let's say, for example, somebody's in the Philippines where the cost of living isn't as high as the United States. Hundred dollars to get paid for a two three hour gig. You know, I, I'm just throwing numbers out. I don't know exactly what the dollar figures would be. But and that's what happened with ice stock, for example. I'm sorry, Shutterstock. Shutterstock. Um, there are people in Russia that are making full time income shooting stock photos for places like Shutterstock. Now the photos sell for pennies or dollars or you know, uh, you it it all turns into volume at that kind of and kind of rate. Now that's a little bit different in that I. For example, I shot a photo in the mall while my kids were in the stores, right? And I did a, a slow shutter speed so the people were blurry. And that ended up making me almost $3,000. Wow. Be it, because it ended up in the high end in the keyword for mall. And people, I, I don't know how many copies of that photo were sold because I was making dollar, $2 a, a sale. You know, but that all adds up. Now, in this case, this is a one-on-one -on -one thing. You can't make one video and have it sell multiple times like you can with iStock and, and Shutterstock. I mean, there are people that are doing, I mean, Shutterstock has videos. You can buy videos for B-roll kind of stuff on Shutterstock, and, and there's thousands of people that are submitting video for that. So yeah, and Video Blocks is another one that... Uh... Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, man, I so I like the idea, and it is interesting that you could use your spare time to make some extra cash on these things. I, I'm just not sure. I don't know. It's not for me. It's definitely I'm not going to go out. And I would. I'm also really concerned about the quality of footage that an editor would be uh, faced with. And if someone sends you their crappy iPhone video and you get it. How do you, you know, how do you make them happy if like everything you edit, they're like, oh, this isn't as good as I thought it would be. I saw this beautiful family video here. Well, you don't have the shots to, <laughs> to make that. Like, how right. do you ever like get that person happy with your work? Now on the business side, you're right. That is kind of nice. If you're like, okay, I own a business and I want to like do a tour and I want some moving graphics, a lot of like short commercial spots or a little ad bits for your website are simply, you know, a pan around of the building, like maybe someone saying a few things in front of the camera and then some motion graphics to go along with that. And that is something that you could knock out in a day. And, uh, you know, in most uh, major markets, uh, that will earn a guy, you know, 1200 or 1500 bucks to go out shoot those really quick uh do the editing do the motion graphics um if they could get this for 500 dollars from someone who they shot it themselves sent it in and aren't as cautious about the quality that they're getting then i mean that's also an option too so i i suppose it makes sense it's there, just there's a know. lot of opportunities there there of course there are questions just like you're asking the same questions were raised back in the days when shutterstock first started and the market works itself out. There are failures just like in Kickstarter. <laughs> uh, you know, Kickstarter may die. You know, you never know. People might get pissed off enough that things aren't getting delivered that Kickstarter may fail. Well, that's the nice thing about Kickstarters. They don't really take the heat directly well, because they're just the platform. They're right. like, hey, I just put this sidewalk here. It's not my fault if you walk on it. So they've kind of got this like separation where the people get mad at the, the creator of the project as opposed to Kickstarter itself. And that's uh, good for them. It continues to keep their platform going. But uh, it's also sort of ominous because you can kind of get away with not policing your own market and right. not having to do anything with it. Now, I've got one more thing I wanted to cover before we get out of here since we've kind of gone off the rails a little bit. <laughs> now, we were talking about f photos here. Actually, i got two things I want to cover. Okay. Uh, we we're talking about photos here, and I wanted to just touch on this real quick. Reuters is uh, banning raw, uh, raw photo submissions from uh, photographers. Now, what do you think about this? They mentioned in this Petapixel article I linked to that – it will increase ethics 
and then secondarily speed. <laughs> and I thought right away, like I'm like ethics my butt. They just Amen. don't want to work with raw photos anymore. Speed is one thing. I can understand that that speed. To, yeah. I don't know how long does it take to transmit. I mean, if if you're talking about seconds, then adding up seconds over time, which time management people used to do in the old days. I remember taking a class back in the 70s where we did time and motion studies of people and how long it took to do specific tasks. And, and if you moved this thing over to there, then you could save some time and out in the sh on the factory floor, time is money, right? Uh, and I can see that processing speed could be an issue with a gob of raw photos. I typically tend to still shoot raw, although in many cases, uh, most people doing similar things are shooting JPEG because it's just faster. Um, the ethics thing is a whole nother issue, and, and everybody that has ever done photography knows that you can edit a JPEG just as easily as you can exactly. a raw image. So. Uh, I can I can modify the hell out of any JPEG just as much as I can. You bring a JPEG into Photoshop and you do anything the hell you want to with it. Yeah, when I saw that ethics statement, I just I had to stop myself from rolling my eyes. I'm like, <laughs> you guys, you just wanted to cut one more person off of your staff so that you don't have to worry about processing raw images when they come in because it takes a little bit longer. Yeah. Um, ugh, man, so that's there's not a lot else to say on that. The other one I wanted to really quick touch on <laughs> is the Lightroom release of 6.3. Uh, if you were using Lightroom on a regular basis like I do, uh, this was really frustrating, lots of crashes, lots of issues with uh, locking up your your entire uh, preview file system would go down and you have to recreate previews. Uh, they've released 6.3, which has added support for the Sony RX1, uh, R2, as well as some Nikon F-series lenses, and they fixed a number of the bugs. Uh, I have yet to open it up this morning to look at the import section to see if they've corrected that hot mess, <laughs> but... Uh, it's out there. If you uh, go to your Adobe Cloud settings, you can download 6.3. Now, Mitch, I know you're not much of a, a Lightroom user, so this one doesn't really affect you much, but I wanted to throw that into the news. Also, guys, I'll be talking a little bit more down the road about the Zcam. I'm going to cut that from this particular show, though, because i got to go in just a little bit. Mitch, I think this is time to wrap it up. Where can people find you, man? You want me to do rap? I don't do rap, okay? My daughters would laugh at me immensely. Thank goodness they're not here right now. But anyway. Do you do like I'm... the old man rap? The <laughs> bounce up and down a little bit? <laughs> no, let's not even go there. Uh, you can find me at planetmitch.com, planetfid.com, smartbusinessplanet.com, djisagoodguy.com. Make sure you rate the videos and the audios and... SoundCloud and everywhere else DJ is going to tell you about, please, so that we know what you like and don't like. As always, guys, thanks for watching and listening. However, you ingest this podcast, you can find us on SoundCloud, iTunes, <laughs> yes. and anywhere else podcasts are distributed. You can find myself at DSLR Film Noob on Twitter or DSLRFilmNoob.com, and of course, Mitch at Planet 5D. We will see you next time on another exciting episode. That's right, I said exciting, <laughs> Mitch, episode of DSLR Film Noob Podcast. You really, man. Planet A7. But I don't know if anybody can hear me anymore, so. Can people hear me while the music goes on? You just sort of dropped out for a second there, Mitch. No, oh, well, that's because your music's so loud. Sorry, man. No, I'm kidding. I should have said planetA7.com is what I should have said. Maybe I should go reserve that. <laughs> I would take it over now. I mean, that might be the next uh, big, big thing. <laughs> Planet A. Um, actually, a side note before I, I completely get out of here. Um, th there's a, several actors and actresses I work with, and uh, you work with them, and they're like, I should really, you know, create a, a set of headshots on a, a website and have like my reel there so people can see what I can do. And they're like, I I'll definitely someday get the website. And so <laughs> I go home and I just reserve all of their first and last name dot coms. <laughs> And then I'm like, hey, uh, you're going to have to be dash one or dash two now because I own that. And they're like, what are you going to do with it? 
Like, I don't know, I'm just going to put a dick butt on there or something like that and you're <laughs> stuck with it for life. You meanie. No, I gave it to them for Christmas, so now they have their own uh, guess, version of it. But Guess what? Planet A7 is already a website. <laughs> oh, is it? <laughs> well, it's reserved on GoDaddy. I don't know, maybe somebody <laughs> reserved it while the show was going on. <laughs> It's I'll have to so check the cheap. timing. <sighs> Ace, well, there, I, told you, I told you last week or the week before that there is a Planet 7D. Some some guy in Russia decided to create a Planet 7D back when the 7D was first announced. And he ran it quite well for a while, but it never got traction. But it's still there, and he still adds to it every now and then. Now I have to go to Planet 7D and see what that's about. Huh. Yeah, it doesn't look too bad. He's got a firmware announcement from September 2015. Uh-huh. Still... He adds to it every now and then. So, so much, yeah, that is a thing. So much work to keep up writing and doing all the other things that you do in your daily life. If you don't do it for your full-time uh -huh. income, it can uh, really roll you over. All right, I'm going to okay. end the live broadcast now, and then i got to go because go it's open season and DJ needs health care. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay, have a good day, DJ.